Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. Whether you are a home gardener or a high school student, a PhD firefly researcher, or just someone who really loves lightning bugs, I'm grateful for your time and attention. Today, I'm excited to present on the lives of fireflies with a focus on some of the most threatened species in the United States. I wanna show you what they look like and bring you into their worlds. I'll talk a little bit about the threats that they face, as well as how we, can, how we can ensure that generations to come get to experience the awe that these animals inspire. For the past two years, I've been pinching myself that I get to spend my days, and also many of my nights, uh, working on firefly conservation with the Xerxes Society. The Xerxes Society for Vertebrate Conservation is a science-based nonprofit that protects nature through the conservation of invertebrates and their habitats. We have four main programs, which include endangered species conservation, pollinator conservation, pesticide reduction, and community engagement. The butterfly that you see here on the left is the Xerxes blue butterfly. It's the first insect known to go extinct in the US due to human causes. So it's both our namesake and a reminder of why we do the work that we do. We are supported by an amazing community of members here at Xerxes who make our work possible. For any members uh, watching today, I wanna say thank you. And if you'd like to become a member, you can do so on our website. So in most places, February is not prime firefly season, but it feels right to me that I'm giving this talk the day after Valentine's Day. I know so many people who love lightning bugs, not just for their magical lights, but because watching fireflies is something that they've shared with family and friends and other loved ones. Sometimes I think we focus a lot on the material benefits of insects, like the fact that some of them pollinate crops or feed birds or contribute to nutrient cycling. Um, but the full gift of fireflies is more intangible. They strengthen our con connections to people and to place. Places like this forest in Florida, where the night is alive with the quick blinks of lightning bugs called Florida single snappies or this salt marsh in New Jersey, covered with the glowing green traces of keel-necked fireflies at dusk. Or this swamp in Southern Illinois, where rare cypress fireflies dance among the trees. When immersed in scenes like this, I think we often have to pause and remind ourselves that these are insects, insects with lives and needs that are often overlooked, overlooked by us humans. So what is a firefly exactly? Simply put, fireflies are a type of beetle. Um, they're in a family that goes back at least 100 million years. We know this from fossils and from DNA research. And like ladybugs or scarab beetles, fireflies have front wings that are modified to protect their hind wings, which are the ones they actually use to fly. Um, and most beetles have a hard, thick exoskeleton, but fireflies are pretty soft bodied, um, something you may have noticed if you caught them as a kid. So they belong to a sort of subgroup of beetles that have soft bodies. And a good way of distinguishing fireflies from other beetles that look similar is to see if the head is visible from above. In fireflies, uh, the head shield, or the pronotum is the fancy word for it, uh, is really broad and usually hides uh, the firefly's head. You can't, see, you can't see its eyes with this little firefly on the left. Um, and you can't see its mouth parts. On the right um, is a beetle um, that's not a firefly, even though it has very similar color patterns. This is a, a soldier beetle, and you can see that the pronotum, or the head shield, is not really covering the head at all. It's much smaller in proportion. Um, you may have noticed that I didn't sort of include light as part of the definition of what makes a firefly a firefly. Um, 
And we'll get into that a little more uh, later. But fireflies aren't the only beetles that produce light. So in Florida and in Texas, there are the headlight click beetles. Um, if you put them in your hand, they'll do kind of a somersault in the air. And then uh, across much of North America, we have uh, railroad, railroad worm beetles um, that are also called glow worms. Um, and that's what you're seeing here on the right. That's a, a female. And if you turn your light on, it would look kind of like a, a yellowish, yellowish worm or caterpillar. If someone asked me the question, uh, what does a firefly look like? In many ways, uh, the most truthful response would be something like this, what you see here on this slide. Um, fireflies spend the bulk of their lives in the larval stage. It's a phase that can last over 10 months or up to two years. And I think uh, firefly larvae are just super cool and, and very underrated too. Um, I like hearing people try to describe them. I've heard people compare them to trilobites or call them dinosaur caterpillars. To me, some look like roly-poly bugs that have been run through a pasta press. Others look like tiny pangolins or armadillos or like a millipede that doesn't have enough legs. And the larval stage of fireflies is also when they carry out um, one of their important roles in the ecosystem. They're predators feeding on snails and slugs and earthworms and other soft-bodied critters. A larva will stick its skinny head into a snail shell, inject it with a neurotoxin and digestive enzymes, and then slurp up some snail soup. Delicious, right? Fireflies' appetite for snails and slugs means that they provide valuable pest control in certain farming systems, like rice paddies in parts of Asia. So I, I said I would get, uh, get to the light piece, uh, expand a little bit more on the light piece. So the production of light, uh, bioluminescence, um, is what fireflies are most famous for but many people don't know uh, that not all, not all adult fireflies produce light or that fireflies also produce light during their immature phases. And the message that's being sent with the light um, depends a little bit on, on the life stage. So the larva on the left with its green glow is saying, don't eat me, uh, you'll regret it if you do. The female adult firefly in the middle here is saying, I like the looks of you, I'll be your valentine. And the adult firefly on the right is not saying anything at all, um, at least with light, because it has evolved to be day active, meaning it's, it's active during the daytime, not at night. And you can see that it's missing the, the yellow light organs or lanterns on its underside that we usually associate with fireflies. So I said on the last slide that the larva um, was saying, don't eat me, using light as a warning signal. And sometimes people ask me whether fireflies are good food for birds. And the answer is probably not really. Um, so the sparrow on the left has caught a winter firefly and it's holding it in its beak. And I'm guessing this might have been a um, kind of inexperienced bird because when many fireflies are disturbed, they'll start bleeding um, this milky white substance that's very bitter. Fireflies contain toxins that are similar to the compounds found in toads, milkweeds, and monarch butterflies. These are toxins that will uh, interfere with, with heart function, so you can imagine that being a very bad thing. Um, I don't know what happened to this sparrow ultimately, but I'm guessing this may have been the last firefly that it decided to taste. Fireflies do have predators. There are things that eat um, fireflies, um, but the main predators seem to be other arthropods like spiders or assassin bugs. Another question that I sometimes get is whether fireflies are pollinators. Um, and my answer to that is maybe sometimes. Um, they will visit flowers, um, and you can see um, on the left, there's a big dipper on milkweed, and the other two photos, winter fireflies on a couple species of flower. Um, 
We don't know of any uh, plants that really depend on fireflies for pollination, but it's likely that fireflies are at least occasionally helping to move pollen from flower to flower and plant to plant. So now that you have an idea of some basic firefly natural history, I want to zoom out and give you a picture of firefly diversity and conservation in the US. So the taxonomy is still in flux and new species are still being described, but at last count, there were 170, 174 named species in the US. Um, you might be su surprised that some of these points of firefly records on the map um, go so far west. Um, California has uh, day active fireflies and glowworm fireflies. Those are fireflies where the females are flightless and they're the ones producing light. Um, and there are flashing firefly species that go a lot further west than people realize into, um, into Arizona and Nevada and uh, places like very Eastern Oregon. Um, Fireflies across the board really like um, moist habitats, and that's especially true the further west that you west that you go. So is it important to uh, to to get a handle on which of these species um, might be most in trouble or the most at risk of extinction? So in 2020, um, the IUCN Firefly Specialist Group um, released red list assessments for over 130 species in the USA and Canada. So the red list of um, threatened species is an international non-regulatory framework. So it's totally separate from the US Federal Endangered Species Act or the Endangered Species List. Um, that's used to assess extinction risk for species. And species are assigned categories uh, that are on a spectrum going from least concern to critically endangered with additional categories um, for data deficient, um, extinct in the wild, or fully extinct species. Xerxes was really involved in this effort, um, as was the New Mexico Biopark Society, a really important partner in this project. So what did the assessments find? Um, we found that over half of the assessed species um, were in the category as data deficient. So that's the gray, um, the gray chunk of the pie chart, um, which is not surprising because they're just so much that we don't know about insects and their distributions and their the populations of these the of these insects. So that's the the data deficient chunk. Um, at least fourteen percent of the species, those colored red, orange, and yellow, fell in a threatened category. And if those proportions carry over carry over to the data deficient species up to a third of firefly species may be threatened with extinction. A pattern that emerged um, in, this assess in this assessment process uh, was that species most at risk, at risk of going extinct are ones that have evolved to live in very specific specialized habitats. Um, they tend to be a lot less widespread and to be patchy in their distribution. And there are threatened, um, threatened firefly species in some pretty far-flung places in the US, um, but we did find some hot spots. Um, so the Southeast, uh, Florida especially, the Southwest, and the Mid-Atlantic um, all had concentrations of, of threatened species. I'm not going to talk um, about all 18 of the threatened species, but I'm going to introduce you now to five fireflies to illustrate um, the diversity within these threatened species and also some of the threats that they face. So let's begin on the coast of Florida. Imagine you're at the edge of a mangrove swamp. The air is hot and humid and salty, 
and you're wearing rubber boots because of the mud. You're here to see the Florida intertidal firefly. And as darkness settles, you're rewarded with their twinkles appearing among the mangrove roots. If you look at one of these fireflies up close, you'll see clear domed windows over their eyes, kind of like a helicopter's windshield. And if you're lucky enough to catch a female, you can see her wide light organ or lantern um, that firefly expert Lynn Faust uh, likes to describe as cowboy hat shaped. The larvae are equally distinctive. Um, you can find them by their greenish glows as they crawl around the damp sand and mud near the high tide line. I found one pupa before, that's the, the phase um, as it's transforming into an adult, and that's the photo on the right. Um, and what really amazed me was that the, it was pupating um, below the high tide line. So as it was in this totally um, immobile um, phase, it was getting flooded with seawater uh, once or twice a day. So if you move inland in Florida to the, to the central ridge, um, which has very sandy soils and fire adapted ecosystems, you'll find a glowworm firefly called the ant loving scrub firefly. And the male and female look dramatically different from each other. That's the female on the left. And she gives a steady greenish glow to catch the eye of the male, that's the male on the right, um, who will search for her um, on the wing. And this species is associated with ant nests of a, of a couple different species. And we don't know exactly why. Um, it could be that they like the microclimate of the nest um, or that they're getting some other kind of form of protection. Um, firefly species with flightless females like this one and other glowworms have this added vulnerability um, because if they get wiped out in a particular place, it's hard for them to um, reestablish themselves there. It's not like they can just fly several miles um, to um, set up shop again in a place where they used to live. Next, we'll go uh, further north. Um, if you follow the sounds of frogs calling in May or June um, in a handful of southeastern states, you might, come you might come across the site of loopy five fireflies displaying over a pond or marsh. It's a species that I've surveyed for in Georgia and South Carolina, and it's quite rare. You can count um, on two hands, less than two hands, um, or two hands, um, all of the known sites um, where, it, where it occurs. And firefly expert and field guide author Lynn Faust uh, was the one who gave this species its common name, Loopy Five. And I, I just love how that name is both whimsical and fun and a, also a really good descriptor of the flash pattern. So the males will stay in a pretty small area, um, like airspace, and they'll give a rapid series of blinks and glows as they fly up and down, like they're doing somersaults in the air. Um, scientists at the University of Colorado Boulder, Boulder um, Owen Martin and others at the um, lab of Orich Peleg, have used GoPro cameras to create 3D reconstructions of firefly flashes and flight patterns. Their data suggests that Loopy 7 might be a slightly more accurate name, uh, at least for some populations. Even though flash patterns are a visual phenomenon, I also I often think of them being like sound or music. Rhythm and timing are really important to pay attention to in order to identify species. And air temperature is sort of the metronome that sets the tempo. The hotter it is, the faster the flash is. So firefly researchers uh, will usually carry a thermometer with them to kind of calibrate uh, the observations that they take. 
The Luby 5 Firefly also is a reminder that small wetlands can be hugely important for lightning bugs and other biodiversity. The person who gave the Luby 5 its scientific name, Photurus forestii, um, was a firefly researcher from Florida, Jim Lloyd, and he didn't get to study the species for very long because literally three days after he found the first known population, the habitat was bulldozed to build a golf course. So he took the photo on the left to document this as, as it was happening. And he went back to that site um, in future years and never saw that, um, that firefly again. So again, just a reminder that um, small wetlands matter a lot um, and probably disproportionately for fireflies. So you probably don't associate Arizona with fireflies, and I definitely didn't either um, until the past couple of years. Um, but wetlands in the southern part of the state support multiple species of flashing fireflies, including the southwest spring firefly, which is pictured here on the screen. Last year, uh, Xerces uh, formally requested that the US Fish and Wildlife Service protect this species by listing it um, under the Endangered Species Act. And we recently got the news um, that the federal government agrees that this species deserves more study and that a listing might be warranted, but it's gonna be a multi-year process before that decision is, is fully made. One of the big threats to the Southwest Spring Firefly um, in the Southwest is trampling and, and overgrazing um, due, to, due to cattle. So the, the last uh, threatened firefly that I'm gonna show you is the keel-necked firefly. The common name um, comes from a trait that actually all fireflies in the Pyractamina genus have, which is a raised line down the middle of their head shield. You'll remember pronotum is the fancy word uh, for this structure. So starting about 40 minutes after sunset, these fireflies will emerge from the salt marsh grasses and give these swooping glowing green uh, flashes that kind of rise and fall in very uh, graceful arcs. And the species has an odd distribution. It's known from Alabama and Florida and from New Jersey to Maryland, um, but it's never been found in Georgia, the Carolinas or Virginia. Um, answering that question would definitely require more survey, survey effort um, in the, in the on the southeast coast. Um, but because they depend so much on salt marshes, and particularly the highest part of salt marsh, uh, um, the part that gets flooded not on you know, not every single day, um, sea level rise is a really major concern for this species. This is what the larvae look like. I, I think they look like a little, a little bit like a banana. <laughs> Um, and they're thought to be snail specialists. You can um, see how their, their head is very kind of long and skinny and tapering, good for shoving into a, into a snail shell. Um, and it's really amazing um, for me to think about right now that it's February, winter, and these larvae are out there um, in the icy salt marsh um, surviving. It's, it's just amazing that they can do that. I took this photo uh, last July in coastal New Jersey of keel necked fireflies displaying. And you can see that even though I was in a wildlife refuge, um, the city lights of Atlantic City um, are really encroaching on the scene, even, even though they're several miles away. Um, we don't really know how sort of distant lights affect fireflies, um, but we do know that when artificial light is close to firefly habitats, it can really interfere with firefly communication and reproduction. Fireflies will move away from more brightly lit areas. Um, they don't see each other's flashes as much. Um, and sometimes really bright light will totally just 
kill kill their mood. Even if they're in the same um, sort of enclosure together, they'll just refuse to mate. They're absolutely not interested in it. So light pollution um, is is a really a growing concern for firefly conservation, partly because uh, light pollution is just increasing so rapidly um, all over the world. So that was my last uh, threatened species to highlight. And at, at this point, some of you might be thinking, well, my backyard isn't mangrove or desert wetland. Like, I don't live near any of those habitats. What about the lightning bugs that I see, the ones that are in my, in my yard or my city's park or my neighbor's hayfield? Um, what about these big dipper fireflies in, the, in this photo um, bringing summer delight to a suburban lawn? Are they in trouble? I think the answer here is, is a bit nuanced. So the big dipper firefly, Photinus pyralis, is categorized as least concern on the red list of threatened species. That means it's found across a, a wide area in lots of different habitats, including some that have been really dramatically altered by humans. And yet they seem very um, adaptable and don't seem to be blinking out in too many places. But does least concern mean no concern? Definitely not. Um, even species like the Big Dipper can disappear from certain areas or become much less common if we don't address the threats to fireflies and to insects more generally. So next, I'm going to talk about a few things that you can do to protect fireflies uh, where you live. So the first is to use outdoor lighting thoughtfully and also indoor lighting. In, you know, indoor lighting you can mitigate by, by having curtains and you know, during firefly season, um, being just aware of where the light in your home is, is ending up. This image on the left um, is an example of really not ideal outdoor lighting. Um, you can see that lights being cast onto the shrubs and into, into, into the forest understory. Um, the photo on the right is a much more thoughtful approach. Um, this is in a national park at a sort of bathroom kiosk. And they're using red light. They're putting it kind of just where it's needed um, and, and nowhere else. Much more, more thoughtful approach. Um, you can. Um, it's helpful to use the, the five principles of uh, responsible outdoor lighting um, promoted by the International Dark Sky Association. So outdoor light and light in general should be useful, targeted, low level means dimmed, controlled, that might mean a, a timer or a motion sensor, and warm colored. Um, and in the case of fireflies, um, dim red light, if you need light at all, is really the best because fireflies can see uh, red light, um, but they're much less sensitive to it compared to yellow light or orange light. Another thing um, that you can do, and if you're a Xerces member, you've probably heard this um, a couple times now, is to leave the leaves. So if you have a yard, um, keeping some of the, at least some of the leaves on your property or as many as is practical um, is a great way to nurture the soil and the um, community of insects and other invertebrates uh, living in your yard. Um, here's a photo of a uh, pyractamina, firefly larva um, on, a, on a dead leaf and you can see it blends in well and it's maybe cruising around looking for, for snails to eat. Um, skipping pesticides is really important, um, both in a backyard context and also at the community level. Um, so excess pesticides um, can threaten the larvae and adults, whether that is a, you know, a, a, a grub killer that's, you know, meant to um, 
meant to kill grubs, but is killing all sorts of other insects, including fireflies in the soil or mosquito and tick treatments um, that are not necessarily the most effective way to control mosquitoes anyways, and uh, could be killing, killing fireflies or just making them less healthy and more susceptible to, to disease, um, less, less rigorous. I'm gonna end um, with an invitation to contribute to firefly research. So last year, the Xerces Society launched the Firefly Atlas, which is a collaborative community science project where firefly enthusiasts, land managers, and researchers can submit survey and observation data um, on fireflies with a focus on the most imperiled and data deficient species. If you search for a species and don't find it, um, the Firefly Atlas also has a way of, of getting that data and that's really valuable data to have that's harder to get from um, things like museum records or iNaturalist observations. There are certain regions um, that are of particular interest because of the threatened species that occur there or might occur there. Um, but I wanna emphasize that there are um, data deficient firefly species all across North America. Um, you know, in, in every state, there are probably a handful of firefly species that we know very little about um, and also know very little about how they're doing. So a good starting point um, on the Firefly Atlas website is to check out the filterable species checklist to see which fireflies have been documented in your state or your province. And also you can filter them to see which ones might be of conservation concern. The Firefly Atlas has data sheets that you can download and print. And these will guide you on collecting Firefly data um, that's as useful as possible. Um, there's a training video on, on YouTube given by yours truly um, that talks about how to plan and conduct Firefly surveys as well as how to enter your data on the Firefly Atlas website. Um, Firefly observations will be uh, that are posted will be looked at by experts, um, and these data will help guide further research and also conservation action. I will tell you um, from my own experience that the Firefly Atlas protocols, and I'm the one who, you know, uh, was most involved in designing them can be a little overwhelming and it's not necessarily something you can do from your front porch. Um, when I ask my wife if she wants to go out and look for fireflies with me, she'll pause a little bit and ask, is this a survey or are we just going to watch them? Um, and she's wise to ask this question because for me, um, firefly surveys can be a little bit frenzied um, where I'm juggling a voice recorder and a thermometer and an insect net and a camera. And at one moment, I might be chasing a single blinking firefly. At another, I'll be counting flashes out loud into the voice recorder. Um, or maybe I'll be turning on my headlamp to jot down the air temperature or crouching down to photograph a firefly um, before releasing it. So if you want to do firefly surveys, but you're a little daunted by the process, um, one, feel free to, to reach, reach out to me. I'll have my email in a, in a second. Um, and I also recommend that you ease into it. So one night, um, you could focus on observing the flash patterns. And another night, you could practice uh, catching and photographing the fireflies. And you can eventually start putting these pieces together. I'd also say that. Um, you know, it's important to take some time uh, when you're surveying to just pause and enjoy it um, and, and take a moment to, to experience the beauty. Um, working in pairs uh, or in groups also makes it safer, more fun, and more efficient. So with that, I invite you all to uh, check out the Firefly Atlas um, 
and I will uh, take take questions and open up the the Q and A. I'm going to end on um, this slide during the Q and A, just as reminders of some of the resources um, that we have available that we have available um, both on the Xerxes website and on the Firefly Atlas website. Awesome. Thank you so much, Richard, for that very informative presentation. I have popped some of those links that were referenced into the chat for folks. Um, this looks like it's inspired a lot of awesome questions here. So I'm going to go over to the Q&A and see a lot of these have a lot of upvotes. Um, so the first one is from Linda. And she says, I am converting 25 acres of cornfield to prairie, leaving five acres of woods. I have planted native flowers and grasses, but is there anything I can do specifically to help fireflies either in the woods or on the prairie? Um, that sounds like an amazing start. Um, I really don't have too much to, to offer there. Um, you know, taking a whole habitat approach, I think is, I think is great because there are just so many other insects that will benefit as well. Um, I would just say that as you, as you do this, try and spend some time out at this prairie at night. Um, and you may notice, um, you know, maybe you'll find larvae in September, or October, or in the spring, and, um, you know, spend some time there out, out there during firefly season too, so you can see kind of what areas the, the fireflies um, are using when the flowers are blooming, walk around and see, are you finding fireflies on, on any of those blooming plants? Um, that sounds like an amazing project. And yeah, thank you for restoring uh, firefly habitat. Awesome, yes, thank you. And thank you, Richard, for those suggestions. A lot of great information. Another one that had a lot of upvotes was from uh, Patricia. And she is in New Jersey, but just asking more generally, what is the impact of residential mosquito spraying on firefly population? Do we know? So this hasn't this hasn't really been studied in detail a lot, uh, but I would and I would caution everyone to not take sort of absence of smoking gun evidence for harms to fireflies as um, evidence of absence. To, of, of harms. So the, the chemicals that people tend to use in backyard uh, treatments are pyrethroids, and these are um, chemicals that are toxic to really all, all insects. Um, and, um, you know, sometimes when you're doing, the, when they're doing these mosquito treatments, they'll, they'll say, you know, if you have um, you know, if there's a beekeeper in the area, you know, like we'll try to avoid that area or, you know, close up your hives so that the spraying doesn't affect them. Well, keep in mind that a lot of fireflies are a lot small, actually a lot smaller than a honeybee. So that means that they're affected, being affected by more of this um, compound than, um, you know, proportionally than a honeybee would. Um, so it's, it's an area that would be, um, you know, ripe for more research, but the precautionary principle would tell us um, it's it's not a good idea. Awesome, thank you, Richard. And going along with the theme here of data gaps and needing more research, Don was wondering uh, what are the best strategies to address the data gaps about distribution and abundance, and what are the best survey methods? Um, it's a tough. It's a, it's a tough question. It depends a little bit on the the species. Um, so some of these firefly species um, are not that conducive to community science um, because you really need to dissect them to identify them. And some of them, like the day active ones, um, there isn't a, a good like targeted survey protocol. But for the flashing species and the glowworm species, um, we, we have some protocols on the Firefly Atlas website. Um, 
And I would say that find, excuse me, finding them um, when you're in the right place at the right time um, is, is not that hard because you can just kind of turn off your light and see where the glows or the, the flashes are. Um, the key is to be there in the right, uh, kind of in the right habitat and the, the right, the right season. Um, and that can, that can take, you know, kind of looking at the, all the places where the data deficient species have been found before and making some educated guesses, um, about, um, where, you know, what might be a good habitat and what point in the season would be like the safest window to look for them. Um, thank you so much, Richard. And a few folks have asked, and I can link to our Firefly Friendly Lighting Practices publication in the chat in a moment, but a few folks have asked, you know, they've heard yellow lights are better um, for moths or for fireflies, and then some folks are wondering about red as well. Can you repeat the question, Carly? Yeah, so some folks are saying they've heard yellow lights are better for moths. Is red better for them too? And then applying that to fireflies um, as well. Yeah, yeah, I believe that it is. So um, the spectrum of light that really draws in lots of moths and, and sometimes fireflies too is the really short wavelength light. So UV and sort of broad spectrum LED will bring in a lot of um, a lot of insects generally. Um, sometimes people say that yellow light, you know, is good is is better from a astronomical light pollution standpoint or from um, you know like a moth standpoint. The kicker is that fireflies are most sensitive to that wavelength. So um, red light is is really a good bet. You know, it's also the color that people use for like sea turtle research um, and things like that. Great, thank you. I answered a few folks' questions. That was a popular one. Um, Taylor has been very active in our <laughs> Q&A box today. And one of their questions was, how do you tell a male from a female firefly? That's a that's a great question. Um, from a distance, um, the males tend if for flashing fireflies tend to be the more um, more actively flashing ones. So the ones you know flying around in the air. Um, that's sort of like a best guess kind of approach. When you see them in hand, um, the arrangement of the light organs is a way, or the lanterns, those kind of yellow patches on the underside. Um, is a good way to tell. And usually in males, those, those lanterns will be bigger or there'll be two instead of one. Um, yeah. Sometimes females too will have a really much bigger abdomen because they have a bunch of eggs that they're going to lay. Awesome. Thank you, Richard. And going along with that, David was wondering, are all firefly heads hidden by the pronotum? Um, the more I learn about fireflies, the uh, like more careful I get about saying like all or none. Um, generally speaking, yes. Um, but sometimes you'll see photos where the firefly was like really actively sticking its sticking its neck out, and in those cases, you will see the the head. Um, and there, are, I don't know. There are, there are more than 2,000 species of fireflies around the world, and I think that some of them um, have heads that protrude, you know, a, a little bit more. Um, but if, it, if you're in the U.S., um, looking at the pronotum is a, is a pretty good way of double-checking, you know, is this a firefly, particularly in cases where the, those um, day-active species that don't have light organs. You can also just flip them over and and see, do they have light organs? That's another way. Awesome. Thank you, Richard. And another question from Taylor is, how can I attract fireflies to my backyard other than native plants? So keeping it keeping it dark is good. Um, honestly, like a rotting 
a rotting log might be a great uh, addition. You know, if you if you think about when you roll over a, a dead log, how many kind of snails and slugs you find under there. Um, I found, you know, firefly larvae under under logs before. It just there's something about the combination of like shelter and food and moisture um, that's that's really great for them. Um, but on, honestly, some of it, some of the reasons for why you have fireflies in your yard or not, or not, will depend also like what your neighbors are doing. Awesome. Yeah, I think that answered a few different questions for folks in the Q and A. So thank you for that. Uh, someone is wondering: Is there a time in the spring to clean up or grind leaves and garden beds that is less harmful to the fireflies? Um, that, I think that's it's a little bit of a little bit of a tricky one. Um, and it kind of goes against. It might go against what works well for like moths and and things like that. Um, I would say that yeah, it's it's hard. I would say that more than uh, like if you need to do cleanup at a particular time of year, um, if you're able to just sort of like take the leaves off your grass and you know put it around the bases of trees or into your um you know flower beds something like that that might be a good middle ground where you're still keeping you're still keeping habitat on your property um but doing the the cleanup that you that you want to do okay and along with that do you have any insight on the best depth of leaves for the fireflies are deep leaf piles detrimental to them I, I don't know um, the answer to that. You could you could go out at night, um, you know, in the spring or fall or summer, um, especially like after it's rained, um, and see if you find anything glowing and maybe um, toss it around a little bit. I I I don't imagine that a deep um, leaf pile would be would be bad for fireflies. Great. And do you have any? Personal anecdotes or stories from the field. Do you have any examples of successful rewilding of urban areas that have helped bring back fireflies? Um, there have been some cases in, this isn't a personal story, but there have been cases of uh, sort of habitat restoration in urban parks in parts of Asia, I think Taiwan. Uh, where fireflies um, have been restored in, in urban settings. Um, I'll say that, you know, some of the places that I've surveyed for fireflies have been in relatively urban settings. Um, and you've just had, you know, a state park or a city park that um, is managing their habitat well. And you have this, this island of habitat where, where fireflies are, are hanging on. Awesome. That's great to hear. And uh, Diana had another question. Can you talk a bit about best practices for catching them for observation? And that goes along with another question that was asking, is it harmful to catch them? Yeah, I, I wonder about this a lot because catching them is part of, um, you know, the way that we study them. And as much as possible, I try to do, you know, non-lethal surveys. So I, I let them go. And if I you know, if I do collect specimens, I try to keep it to a very small number. Um, they're, you know, their bodies are a little bit soft. So I try to be firm, uh, firm, but not like squeezing them. Um, and when I handle them, kind of like holding them by the, either by the very center of their body, their thorax or their, um, or their legs can be a good way of sort of hanging on to them without doing harm to them. Um, sometimes I, I, I honestly feel bad taking photos of them because I imagine that that photography um, <laughs> doesn't feel great for their eyes. Maybe that's just me projecting, but um, yeah, handling, catching and handling fireflies 
um, it definitely has some impact on the individuals um, and we try to make it as as worthwhile as as possible. And then going along with that kind of serving type, um, someone was asking if you have any opinion um, in terms of surveys on like the difference between sit spots or transit. Surveys? Transect. Maybe it's supposed to be transect. <laughs> yeah. So um, transect. It kind of, kind of depends on the habitat and also um, how densely how how dense the fireflies are. So for example, the Florida intertidal firefly, they found like you'll just kind of see a handful of them at a at a time. Um, and also that intertidal area, it lends itself well to sort of a linear uh, route. So walking along the intertidal zone. Um, for some of the wetland species, um, like a pond or a marsh, uh, a stationary survey um, might be a little more effective. Awesome. Thank you so much. And um, someone is wondering how likely in a residential neighborhood is it that I can attract fireflies? Um, so when you say attract, that implies that they're coming from, from somewhere. And if there are fireflies relatively nearby, like, you know, a couple hundred meters, definitely like less than a mile. Um, I think that if your yard um, is supporting of lots of different types of insects and bees, um, there's a good chance you'll have fireflies as well and you're not spraying and you're having like leaf litter for, for fireflies to live in. Um, but there has to be some sort of source population. So, um, you know, at the, at the neighborhood, if, if everyone in the neighborhood is doing things that are really not very firefly friendly, um, it's, it is going to be a lot harder um, for fireflies to show up in your yard if they haven't been there for a while. And that makes sense. Thank you, Richard. And I know that you touched on this already via like the depth of the leaf litter and what folks can do um, to attract fireflies to their yard. Um, Meryl was wondering if you could speak any more regarding the life cycle in terms of where they are in stages like underground or in grasses at what time of year um, during their life cycle. It sounds like a lot of people are trying to avoid doing any harm to the fireflies, which is great. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, winter, sort of the depths of winter is when they're the most hunkered down. And there's there's a common species in the sort of Eastern uh, US called the winter firefly. So it's mid-February and it was a warmish day in Massachusetts um, on Saturday. And I saw more than a dozen winter fireflies um, on Saturday and they were kind of tucked into the, tucked into the nooks and crannies of, of tree, tree bark. Um, Pyrectomina fireflies, um, some of them uh, will crawl up tree trunks in the spring as larvae, and then that's where they transform into adults. They pupate on the on the tree trunks. Um, from Pinus fireflies, which are the the group that the Big Dipper um, belongs to, um, they're much more kind of soil based. Um, so people will sometimes find a pupa. Um, in the you know early summer when they're like digging in their digging in their garden, um, and yeah, so it it depends a little bit on the species, but um, and the sort of general group. But I would say during the spring, uh, you know, fall, winter, and spring, um, leaf litter, soil, um, tree bark. Uh, nooks and crannies, um, that's probably where a lot of the fireflies are. Great. Thank you. And also just a little bit more of a fun, lighthearted question from Taylor. She is wondering what your favorite firefly species is. Uh, it, you know, it changes changes so often. It's usually the one that I'm uh, looking for in any given sort of part of my field season. 
Um, I'll say that I, I really like the Loopy 5 Firefly. It was the, the first um, Firefly that I kind of surveyed for on my own um, back in spring 2022. Um, I really like the Florida Intertidal Firefly too. They're just really, they're just really charming. Um, but, you know, my favorite Firefly changes every week, I would say. Uh -huh. <laughs> that definitely makes sense. And that was Taylor's favorite species too. So I'm sure they're glad to hear that, the Loopy 5 Firefly. <laughs> and Michael is wondering, in terms of the Firefly Atlas project, have we done any collaborations with iNaturalist to share that data? Or if they do have an observation, does that need to be submitted separately to iNaturalist and the Firefly Atlas? So like iNaturalist is an amazing tool. It's it's really user friendly. Um, it's operating at you know a really big global scale. Um, it's updated magnificently and and the and the team that like runs iNaturalist like they do amazing work um it's a lot harder with iNaturalist to get more structured data about things like um weather conditions and how far you how like how long you looked you could sort of force those data in there um but it iNaturalist is at the observation level and with Firefly Atlas, we also manage data at the survey level. So, and that will let us, for example, know um, when, um, you know, when someone looked in the right habitat with the right weather conditions at the right time of year in the right general geography and didn't find a species. Um, so I, I would say like, if you already use iNaturalist and you're, you're already submitting photos of fireflies, I, you don't necessarily need to switch over to Firefly Atlas because the data in iNaturalist are available. Um, but if you want to contribute some more sort of nuanced data that also include like, how long you looked for? Did you, did you look for half an hour or did you look for an hour and a half? Like how much, area did you cover? Um, that information can give us, um, there's just more insight that we can tease out of that than just a whole lot of points on the map. Um, I hope that answered the, the question. Yeah, I think that was a great answer, Richard. That's a lot of information. Thank you. And a few folks are wondering how long fireflies live as in a common question. Um, so, um, some of what we know about this is based on fireflies kept in captivity. Um, so there are some folks out in Colorado who, um, were experimenting with, um, raising firefly larvae and it took a full two years, um, for the firefly larvae to become adults. Once they're adults, the vast majority of species will only live, um, you know, less than a month, two, two to four weeks, let's say. Um, and in, you know, there may be shorter lived species, like they're in, in more southern areas, in the sort of subtropics, you may have generations that are like kind of longer lasting, and then generations that just much the larvae mature to adult very quickly and then die and maybe it's just a matter of months that they're living great thank you sounds like there's a range there and i just wanted to note that um it is the top of the hour and so if folks need to leave we completely understand but we're going to keep going for about 10-ish more minutes we've got a lot of questions in the q a here and thank you so much for sticking with us and thank you to richard um, Trish is wondering, is there a minimum plot size for restoration projects for fire, firefly habitat? How important is connectivity and size of home range? Ooh, that's a, that's a hard one. I would say that connectivity is, is quite important. Um, the one loopy five, uh, population that I know of is like, really, really tiny. 
Um, it's like in just one section of one small pond. Um, the whole watershed has not really been surveyed, so I don't have a good idea of you know what the minimum distance is. Um, but you know, I think going out and seeing what are the habitat scales at which fireflies are persisting um, might be a good way of um, making a guess at that at that question. Um, I think you answered about fireflies liking snags. They do like dead trees and logs, it sounds like. Someone said that um, they had oak trees in their yard that were lit up like a Christmas tree from all the fireflies and are oaks important to firefly habitat? Um, so I don't, you know, there are some firefly species that are really using the bark furrows a lot more. So the there's a firefly called the springtime uh, treetop flasher. Um, and people around the country are starting to see more and more, um, like at this time of year, you'll see more and more larvae as the spring progresses. Um, so, you know, white oaks or other oaks that have um, really textured bark might be, might be helpful. Um, but it's, I don't, I really don't know if there are per particular species of tree that are important, like from a dis, you know, adult display reason. Maybe they just go to like a, a tall, a, you know, a tall object mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, has a good view. I've seen, I've seen a, an odd phenomenon I, I saw in Indiana once was fireflies that were sort of like hovering around a, um, a power line, like a big metal power line structure. And it's it was almost like they were treating the 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 power line tower as as if it were a tree. Um, Very cool. Thank you for sharing. And um, a few folks have asked how many eggs a female can lay in her lifetime. Um, for for some, it, it really depends on the um, on the species. Um, I'd say dozens is probably sort of average. Um, could be as few as like twenty, and then in in some species, um, it can be several hundred. Um, and these eggs are are quite small, so the survivor, you know, the survivorship of them is. The survival of them is probably pretty low, probably really pretty prone to things like drying out or getting attacked by fungus, that sort of thing. So it sounds like it's a range, just like their lifespan kind of across species. Um, this one is more of um, specific, and so I know that you do your work nationally, so no, no pressure here, but someone is wondering about the endangered fire spies in Indiana. They said their state is currently working to pass a law to be able to build on wetlands and then supposedly create new wetlands in the state to replace those. Um, so they were just wondering about endangered fireflies in Indiana, if they have any, if that's going to impact that law passing. So, so Indiana has the northernmost known population for the cypress firefly. That's the one that I, sh I showed a slide of um, at the beginning of the presentation. Um, and the population in Indiana is kind of curious because it occurs in places that don't ha actually have cypress trees, but it's found in these pretty special um, swampy swampy wetlands. Um, that the red the red list category for the species is vulnerable, um, so it's it's threatened, but maybe not as threatened as some of the other ones, um, and. Um, yeah, again, that's that's not a legally, there's nothing um, regulatory about the the red list categories. And Jaren is wondering, do fireflies inhabit all mesic environments or specific types of ecosystems such as mesic grasslands? Yeah, so um you you know, you'll, you'll actually, you know, I said that fireflies really like 
moisture. Um, but there are, for example, glowworms that are found in really dry um, desert areas. And even though, you know, a lot of the fireflies that I focused on in this presentation were, were wetland ones, um, you know, upland forest with like medium moisture um, can also have a lot of different firefly species. And in the, you know, Midwest prairies, I, I feel like, um, you know, or grasslands um, in the Great Plains, we haven't really given very much attention to them. And there's some data deficient species that I'm pretty curious about, um, about out there. Um, I hope that answered the question. If, if not, happy to follow up. All right, awesome. And I have shared Richard's email in both the chat and the Q&A for folks. I think we have time for just a couple more here. Uh, so Mary is wondering, she says, we have seen evidence of a species displaying twice during the same year. Do you believe this to be a fast developing second generation or delayed second season? Uh, hi, Mary. Yeah, I, you're talking about a, a place in, in Texas, um, right, in the Armand Bayou. I don't know. Um, that's a, it's a fascinating mystery and I do not know the answer to that. You know, it, it's hot enough that I could imagine it being a second generation, but there's, you know, you'd have to dig into it more. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot left to be studied in this field of fireflies for sure is the, the theme. <laughs> um, a few folks are asking, so you mentioned wetlands, uh, do fireflies like swamps, are there any like big plants associated with those that fireflies like, such as like milkweed and monarchs that kind of go together um, in swamps and wetland habitats? Yeah, I'd say that sometimes there are indicator species so that when I'm looking, for example, for a loopy five, um, good habitat to survey in, um, like broadleaf arrowhead and, um, you know, jewelweed. There are certain plants that I'll associate with the species, but I don't really think that the fireflies are really depending on those species. I think it's more just a good a good search image. Um, so I wouldn't look for. It, it's not like with bees or with butterflies, where it's like if you want this in your garden, you know, plant this family of plants or plant milkweed. You know, you want. Um, you want structure, you want shade, um, and you want vegetation that's gonna that's gonna hold moisture. Um, but the relationship between the firefly and the plant is a little more indirect than with uh, pollinators. Great. And I know some folks have had to jump off, and there's a common question of they joined late, and is this going to be posted anywhere? This webinar has been recorded. It's going to be posted to our YouTube channel called Xerces Society. So youtube.com slash Xerces Society. I think we have time for one more question here. Uh, Natasha is wondering, is there an elevation gradient for fireflies in the United States? Um, so you'll see a gradient um, in terms of when firefly season happens. So with the same species, um, you know, it'll be they'll be displaying um, more higher up at, at higher elevations. Um, I don't know of any fireflies in truly like alpine or or subalpine areas. Um, so you can have like really cool diversity in the Smoky Mountains, for example, but you also have, um, you know, very cool diversity in the in the Southern Plain. Um, so yeah, gradient in phenology, and you will have some species turnover, but I don't know exactly about the, you know, the how the diversity changes in terms of number of species. Got it. All right, well, Richard, you're getting so many thank yous in both the chat and the Q&A. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. And thank you, Richard, for this very informative presentation. We had lots of great questions today. People were very active in the Q&A. So this is clearly a very intriguing topic to folks. And thank you all so much. And 
please answer the evaluation on your way out if you're able to. Have a great rest of your day. Hi, folks. Hi, Teddy. So someone requested a, a shout out in the Q&A. So <laughs> hi, Teddy. Fireflies are awesome. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you, everyone. And remember, it's, it's 2024, not 2023. <laughs> Thanks, Richard.